It is the Anfield Wrap, Neil Atkinson with Carl Kopak, John Gibbons and Gareth Roberts with you in the week preceding the start of the Premier League season. Uh, there's a lot going on, to be quite honest with you. There's a lot going on in a number of different places. Uh, there's obviously transfers and we're going to come on to talk about the financials after the Swiss Rambles put out there, what he's put out there. It's noticeable that it's come out in the last hour or so that two Manchester City players have tested positive for COVID-19. Uh, that will obviously uh, have knock-on effects in general for the season. More footballers are testing uh, positive for at the moment. Uh, all of this we're going to pull into a little bit of a tapestry for this one, uh, for this show right now, uh, where we are going to talk about that Swiss Ramble thread on Twitter. And if you haven't seen it, do check it out. He is excellent and worth paying attention to if you are interested in this sort of thing. And I think this is almost the start point for the conversation, Gareth. I don't want to get into line by line going through the Swiss Ramble thing in that there's a lot of in-depth financial stuff within it. And that's sort of the point. That's not really what we all get into football for. But the way this summer's taken a turn, going right the way back to Hicks and Gillette, however long ago when we all started to understand what leveraged buyouts are. Unfortunately, this sort of, these bits and pieces have actually become part of a strand of Liverpool fandom and a strand that flares up whenever uh, games aren't playing, uh, whenever there are other things to focus on. Yeah, it does stem from Hicks and Gillette. It stems from a time when we thought we were lied to, when we thought that, you know, we had a set of owners who didn't know, didn't do what they said they were going to do, never did build that stadium. (laughs) Spade in the grass. He he did uh, did come up with some very expensive plans. Um, And I I think since then, you know, anyone who's come near Liverpool, whether they've actually even got through the door in terms of owners, has been eyed with a certain amount of suspicion and everyone does the digging and... You know, you think about some of the people who were interested in Liverpool who didn't buy Liverpool, it it happened to them as well. So, you know, to a certain extent, that's healthy, I think. And then to a certain extent, it isn't. Um, You know, for me, the continual talk of FSG, what they're doing, how they're doing it and all the rest of it, I I personally find quite wearing. um, And I'm finding it very wearing at the moment. I mean, you know, I enjoyed the friendly on Saturday. Uh, I enjoyed the fact that, well, I am enjoying the fact that football is returning this weekend and we've got the game against Leeds United. I'm a little bit gutted, obviously, still, like always, that I'm not going to be in the ground. Um, But yeah, I I just think, you know, I I can't bring myself to be a hypocrite about it all. I I wrote and spoke at the time when we had Hicks and Gillette and said, "I I want Liverpool to be running away that is... Um, sustainable, that doesn't threaten the future of the club, that we sell, that we buy players with the money that we make and that kind of thing. Um, and I believe that's going on right now. And, you know, and not, nothing that's on the Swiss Ramble this morning has made me change my mind. Um, all I see there when I go through that, 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 that thread, and it is excellent and it is broken down in a very simple way for people who haven't got a qualification in accounting. I, th- I think what it says to me is that Liverpool... We're at a certain stage in the journey, once upon a time, not so long ago. And now they're at a different stage. Now they're paying a lot more money out in wages. Players that once upon a time might have been on 70 or 80 grand are on double that figure and more these days, and rightly so, because they deserve it, because they've turned into elite players on Liverpool's books. Liverpool have signed them up again, if you like, as elite players and are paying them accordingly. And, and you know, all, all the beef seems to come down to is signing Thiago. Um, if we sign Thiago, everyone's happy and shut up. If we don't sign him, <laughs> e- e- everyone's going to say the terrible owners. And you know, it's a bit ridiculous for it to to spin on one player for a lot of people. That's what it, that's what it looks like to me. Obviously, everyone's different, and that's a bit of a blanket statement. But I I, I just. I, I just find it weird, and as I say, and it, it gets me down a little bit, the constant talk of it. We should be excited about the fact that we're about to defend the league title after waiting 30 years to win it. I think the idea that it's wearing for some people, John, for a lot of people, uh, is is really, really valid. And I think that, that this is almost a bit I want to get into more than just literally the, the, the nuts and bolts of the finances. As Gareth says within the, within the Swiss Ramble thread, there is a couple of major takeaways. One was sort of like quite nicely summed up by Rob, actually, who went back to him and just said the growth in wages, wages is key, I think, around four, over 40 million, over the last, sorry, around 40 million over the past two years. That's akin to 200 million in transfer fees across five years. Uh, and it is the cost of success. And the key line is this, LFC have had to effectively rebuy their own players with big wage deals. Um, what I think sort of, you know, I am the, the, the use of wearing by Gareth is I think, is, is I think there or thereabouts because the thing about all of this is there hasn't been 
the there hasn't been the moment where you get to let off steam. There hasn't been the moment in the grounds that there is a thing where we haven't actually got to be unbearable really in person on mass there hasn't been that moment and therefore then that can't by people who aren't lucky enough to be able to go to the games that can't be enjoyed vicariously and I think that this is a little bit of a perfect storm really from a from a Liverpool fandom point of view because we should all be unbelievably excited by virtue of the fact that we're about to defend the first Premier League title it should really feel massively like job done and yet people are just sort of doing their own heads in and doing other people's heads in in the process yeah and I think that's fair and I think you know, we, we we should have spent the whole summer, shouldn't we, hugging each other and, and celebrating and, you know, and all that. And, and, and that couldn't happen. And, and we weren't sort of in the ground for that big moment. And, and as you say, even if you're not there individually, you still get to sort of see that, hopefully, you know, share it through people like us and stuff like that, you know, and the content that we put out. And I think without that, people it, it people have just got to be consumed by fear, really. Well, what, what if we never get it? And I think it seems to be that. And, and all... You know, all of football sort of gone online now, and I'm not sort of you know anti you know online discourse. I think for a lot of people, their connection with the football club has, has come from that. You know, I've got friends who met through forums and stuff, so I've been a, an online Liverpool fan as much as anyone really. But it's been alongside the match going stuff, and it's been alongside the you know just meeting up with people, either that be you know to go the game or to watch it all together and things like that. And and I think with that's been removed, like you know if you. You know, if, if, if you go into the game and your mate's like, oh, just worry, we haven't bad bought anyone. You know, someone just goes, oh, sh- don't worry, just sh- sh- shut up, will you? We're going to get, do you know what I mean? We're doing this, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, you know, see what happens. Whereas you haven't got that now. So you're just going online and saying, I'm dead worried. Then someone else is agreeing. And then you're all sort of talking each other into this panic. And I think that's sort of what's doing. And, and we seem to have forgotten what a fantastic position that we're in. And, you know, we seem to have forgotten sort of our role as supporters, really, which is to, to, to you know, I'm looking forward to getting behind, behind the boys this weekend. I'm like Gareth, do you know what I mean? Like, I'm looking forward to supporting them. I'm looking forward, to, you know, it's not going to be, I'd love to be in Anfield. I'm not going to be, I'm going to be, you know, I don't know, I'm actually in the lakes, to be honest with you. So I'm going to be mm-hmm. reliant on Wi-Fi. Um, so that's going to be fun. But, you know, it's, it's going to be a case of, you know, I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. I can't wait to see them all play again, like properly. Obviously, we've had the defenders and the community shield, but this is the real deal. I'm looking forward to seeing what leads are like and throwing the challenge, but I'm sure we'll overcome it because that's what we do. And I think we can, we're in danger of sort of talking ourselves into a crisis that, that just doesn't really exist. It's the fear, I think, Carl. This is this is what I'm sort of getting from people is there's this, there is this fear now of of losing the thing that we said we all wanted. And we've not really got to enjoy. And I sort of feel a bit at times like, well, I haven't got to enjoy this thing that we said we all wanted. I haven't yet got to. One of my favourite moments of last season was going away to Old Trafford when I was completely consumed by winning the league. I think at that point we'd won eight or nine of the first the first eight or nine games. And it was all about winning the league. And then it turned up and loads of lads were passing out sixes. And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah the European Cup, that was boss, wasn't it? Yeah. And, but, and I got to enjoy the fact that we were going to Old Trafford as European champions and giving it that big one. And as I say, it literally only when I got in the, And thank God those lads were on top of the admin. It was only when I got in the ground that I sort of <laughs> remembered, yeah, that I remembered this, and 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 we got to give it the big one there. And I think that everyone's just got this really quite profound fear that you know everyone keeps talking to me about the gap, and my attitude is, yeah, the gap's going to close because the gap's mental. We should not finish thirty three points ahead of Manchester United and yeah. Chelsea. It's mad. They pay the wage bills that they pay. They've got the money that they've got. We've got the same money on wage bills, by the way. So they should be a lot closer to us. That's how this is meant to work. And everyone to me, Carl, just feels, just seems, is just acting. And when I and I am using a bit of a broad everyone because it's everyone I get to see talk yeah. about Liverpool. It's not you know I'm not getting to go to the pub and see people. So it's everyone I get to see talking about Liverpool. Everyone just seems afraid. Yeah, I mean to, to be honest, look, the old traffic example is a bad one for me because the day before I climbed Snowden. Um, when everyone was celebrating Lalana's goal, I was hanging on to like the post at the side, trying to keep my knees in the same place because I was absolutely done in. Um, yeah, there, there is a bit of a fear, and I, I think it, it, it does stem from the fact that you know we didn't get to run down Bowl Street with a replica trophy or anything like that, or just do silly stuff when we won the league. And I, I listened to, um, to to the to Times podcast about this, and they said, "Well, well, it is going to be closer this year. This league is going to be closer." And I had the same thing. I, I had a sense of. Oh God, you know, more tension. I mean, we won it by a canter this last year, but I was tense then. So, you know, if this gets down to four points, I'm going to, if my head's going to go completely, but then I thought, it can't possibly go the other way. 
We, could, we can't win the league by 45 points. And, and even then, I'd still be, um, you know, because Gibbo was talking there about, um, you know, looking forward to the game again. I just thought it's, you know, because we saw the charity shields and stuff like that. But this, this is football with tension. And I only ever watch football with tension anyway. So I'm always sort of a bit scared. My, my default facial position at the match is always a frown. And what's going on? We could be 4 0 up and I'm still be going, I don't understand why he's doing that. Why is he doing that? And then panicking about it. So, you know, winning the league by 40 odd points or whatever it was. Not enough for me. I'm still never going to be calm. <laughs> so uh, my default position is usually fear anyway. But it, it is, uh, you know, it is going to be worse. But um, I think it's also quite interesting, though, be- that the manager said, we're not going to defend the league, we're going to attack it. Yeah. And and if we're only six clear on Boxing Day, I'm going to start thinking, he's let us down. No, I'm not. We're six points clear on Boxing Day. That's actually quite a good thing. Um, it's just people, the way people's mindsets work. I think there is there is something in all of this, Gareth. But it is mindsets, and it's also just not being used to it. And I think that this is what sort of hit me in that you know I've genuinely felt like, and I I, I mean I'm 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 all right with me to be quite honest with you, which is you know a dreadful sentence. Well, I'm you know, to be fair to me, uh, it's never a position you want to be in. But there is you know, I think that there is a real just this how you do this what's the next thing what does it all look like and what does it all feel like and it is obviously wild because of the because of the covid stuff because of the pandemic as well that just adds to it but there is you know one of the things i almost want to say to everyone at the minute is are you enjoying this enough because this is brilliant this is the best it gets and then it becomes but we don't want to lose it and that's the next thing that comes out of people's minds. You don't want to lose it. And then, I'm, but then you're a bit like, well, City lost it. They've had more money than anybody ever. They had two seasons on the bounce where they got, a, got 90, over 95 points in both of them, average 99 across two seasons. And then it just went a little bit wrong for them last year and they got 80 odds. And you're like, you can't, you can't win forever. And, and, and that's not a lack of ambition to acknowledge that. It's more so when you are winning, you've got to really, really enjoy it. Yeah, you have. And, and look, I, I understand some of the some of the stuff that's going on. I'm not daft, you know, I've said, I've said on numerous occasions now, you know, obviously Thiago strengthens Liverpool, so why wouldn't you want him to, to be signed? I, I, I do want him to be signed. I'd, I'd be really excited if he signed. I'd love to see him in a red shirt. Equally, you know, I'd like, I think Liverpool should be looking at another centre-half. I think Liverpool should be looking at somewhere else up front, ideally. But it's more the fact that it's, I see a lot of sort of black and white about it and it, it's all very like, you know, if we went into the season and we don't know, we still don't know, you know, there's a, there's the rest of this week, there's, there's another month of the transfer window, then you've got January as well, um, you know, there's, there's time to, to sign players, but it's, it's, it's the black, when I say the black and white, it's the black and white around, if we don't get anyone, then we're doomed, then it's all over, and you know, that, that's not how football works, you know, like we, we've had good title challenges in the past that just haven't or the fruit that we wanted them to, to do. Um, you know, this time around we did it. And the 97.1 obviously should have been a title in any other year and, and wasn't because City were excellent. So there's, there's no guarantees whatever you do, but I just don't see how if we don't buy anyone else, we drop off a cliff. I just don't think it's it's in this group. I think, you know, you've talked a lot, Neil, about, about sort of, you know, the average age of the squad. And I totally understand that concern looking long term. But looking to this season, it's actually a lot of players in the peak, you know, and, and, and like things have shifted slightly as well, I think, in terms of how, when players hit the peak and how long mm-hmm. they can play for because sports science has moved on, fitness has moved on. And so, you know, the, the, the nucleus of the, of the squad that we've got is absolutely brilliant. One is the league, one is the European Cup. And people keep saying, oh, you keep saying that. And I'm like, that's because that's not a throwaway yeah. thing. That's a brilliant yeah. thing. That's yeah. a superb thing. And, you know, I, I think to when, you know, we were, we were dying for this to happen, when we were dying to be in the position that we're in now. And we used to look at the squad and say, well, there's no one there really who, who's got that experience, who knows what it takes to win a title. Well, all of them do now. <laughs> or, or, all of them have got that experience. So, you know, look, I... I, I, I hope they do do some business. I really do. Uh, I, I, like I said, I'd love to see Thiago play for us, but I just think equally, you've got to enjoy the lads who are already at the club. And that's why I say about the friendly on uh, at the weekend, you know, I knew as soon as I tweeted anything about it that someone would reply along the lines of, it's only Blackpool. And I just thought, why, you know, why is there always that Meldrew person? Like, it's just all right. You know, it's, it's just all right to say. I know it's only Blackpool, but 
but these players here still played well. Honestly, Gareth, Gareth, if you were saying it was only Blackpool after watching Harvey Elliott be Harvey Elliott in that way, genuinely, like the extent to which I'm like, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm selling Salah off the back of, <laughs> off the back, off the back of Harvey there. <laughs> Salah to me, you can, you have a squad number stripped from him and everything, put him in, have him, have him wear 38 and, and, give, and give Harvey 11. Exactly, but you know, he, he was really exciting. He scores a goal as that lovely cushioned cross on the volley back across the face of the box. You know, there's loads of stuff to get excited about. Curtis looked brilliant again. You know, uh, Minamino is looking is looking a player now and, and, you know, looks like someone who can contribute, which you, you wouldn't have been saying a few months back. Nabby's been exciting sort of end of lockdown into pre-season. You know, and... and I, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to really wind the people up who, who are probably hating what I'm saying, but, you know, they could be like new signings, couldn't they? <laughs> please, please, please don't do that. <laughs> but I'm in, but no, but I'm in Amino, Gareth, he actually is. The piss. No, but I'm in Amino, he actually is. Yeah. You know, we bought him this calendar year, and I think that is also worth sort of worth, worth being quite clear about we've done that. Just want to come back to on, on on a certain thing, is that a lot of this stuff is is really contradictory. And, I'm just, and, I, and I mean that within people themselves. I, I, again, in the same way, like, you know, John said on previous shows, you know, I don't want to sell one album, but a lot of people, you know, want you to, want you, you know, you do, but people are simultaneously saying, we don't want to stagnate, but we don't want to sell any of the good lads. Uh, we don't want to be like Barcelona where the squad's aging. Uh, we need to get some fresh blood in, but we need to, but we, you know, but simultaneously, we don't want to let anyone go because these are all, these are all really, really good players. There's, there is something for me where it is, it is all really difficult. It is all really difficult at this point. But no, but, it, but, it, but, I, but no, I don't think. You see, I, what I think is there's a, there's some Liverpool supporters, and I've said this in the past, and I've said it on shows. There's some Liverpool supporters who I think last couple of seasons when we've got to February, I've felt there's some people who would have been happier if we were trying to come top four in a cup run because you've got more room to lose. So you can ease a little bit. You know, it's all right to drop points if you're just trying to come top four and and, and, and have a bit of a cup run. Uh, so when Carl's saying about the tension ratcheting up, I genuinely think that that's been the case the last couple of years. But now I almost feel as though people would be happier. Some people, and again, this isn't a huge generalisation, but would almost find it easier because it's what we're used to, to support Liverpool, where they're trying to consolidate top four and go from there. But that's almost easier. We're going to get three or four in. A couple of them will succeed. A couple of them will fail. That's all a lot easier for people to process because it's what we're used to. Whereas we've literally never been champions of England and it transpires. We thought we'd be boss at it, but we've actually been a bit shit <laughs> yeah and look the, the other thing on it as well is that i just think you know I said this before as well but you know we are where we are we're still having this debate um you know liverpool under under since Klopp came in and, and since we started to trust edwards and, and the process a bit more i've been clever in the transfer market i've done good business i've sold at good prices i've bought at good prices and i've ultimately put together a team that did what we wanted them to do so I just think that there should be a little bit more trust there. I think, you know, whether you agree with it or not, what they're currently doing, I think surely you read the Swiss Ramble thread and see some sense in what they're doing. You know, where you can argue against it. You can say you should go and get a short-term loan and go and buy some players because everyone else is if you want. Um, they should go and strengthen from a, a, a position of strength because they won the league and surely they're really attractive. True, absolutely true. But equally, you know, it, it's not like, were absolutely desperate for a, for a player in a certain position. You know, every one of those things I said before would be good. But equally, I'm still quite confident that we can challenge whether we get them or not. And, and maybe that's what the position is inside the club. So what I'm saying is, why don't, why don't we wait and see what happens? And this might be what they're saying. Wait and see what happens with the virus. Wait and see when we can get fans back in the ground and guarantee revenues and things like that. And then look to buy, then look to strengthen. We'll still be champions in January. I imagine we'll still be up at the top of the league in January as well. I don't imagine us falling off a cliff. So the sort of the feverish thing of we've got to buy, we've got to buy, and we've got to buy now or we're disappearing over the edge of the earth never to return. That's the bit I don't get. It's choices, I think, John, are, are important. And it's important to say that Liverpool are making choices and that there is more than one way to do things. You don't have to do things the way that the current ownership have chosen to. Um, you know, they could, as Gareth just stated there, they could get a loan. They could loan from themselves. They could get a, a short-term loan. They could do what Tottenham have done, what other sides have done, and they could choose to to put money in for, for player signings themselves. The one thing I think within there, though, is I think they've, they've, I think they've made strong structural decisions not to do that and what i mean by that is that you know 
you make your own rules about what you are and aren't prepared to do. Not necessarily so that you'll never break them, but so you'll think long and hard before breaking them, if you know what I mean. So it, it isn't, well, we'll never, ever, ever do that. But if we say we'll never do that, then when we, if we feel as though we need to, we'll really have to test whether or not we're right. And I think that they've got a lot, I think Liverpool have internally got a lot of their own rules. Uh, just to help decision-making, you know, the speed with which Klopp went, Leo Messi is nothing to do with us the other week. He went, the first opportunity, that is nothing to do with us. So we're not even having meetings about this. You should all have meetings about this. We're not having meetings about this because that is nothing to do with us. That is not our business. And I think there's a lot of that within Liverpool where they've sort of structurally decided a list of things that they'll only break in extremis. And right now they'll be probably wondering, well, we, we, you know, we're a plus 90 point squad. This is not extremis. Yeah, it's, I read in the, the piece on Mike Gordon in the box, Boston Globe last week. And I thought that was, I mean, it was really interesting in a lot of ways, but just reminding yourself who Mike Gordon is and, and, and how he made his money. It was through risk. So basically, he's, he's a successful man from analysing risk. And they don't sort of say it in, in this column, but it immediately made me to think now was, well, he's, this, is, this, is, this is great for him. Do you know what I mean? Like, he's, you know, he was, he was probably rubbishing all the football stuff for a while, but he's like, ah, there's my time to shine now. But you listen here, Jürgen. I'll tell you about risk, you know what I mean? And so, and so he's... This is this is what their their background is. All of them, you know, the, in terms of FSG and particularly Mike Gordon, is, you know, this is how they made money. It was and this is how they were successful. It was by analysing risk. It was by you know making smart decisions when other people aren't. And that's another thing for me is that, you know, I understand that there's, oh, there's the risk of not spending money as well, and there's the risk of you know there's a risk of spending, there's a risk of not because you stagnate or you might fall behind or blah blah blah. But who's to say all these clubs who are spending loads of money are making the right decision? Like we've just decided there it is because it's it's sexy and because you know we we quite like to see it. But I I wouldn't be surprised if 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 there's a few people at FSG looking around a few other clubs. And by the way, one of them's not very far away and going fucking hell, that could all go wrong fast. And it might. So you know we're all saying like throughout all of this, you know the whole thing with 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 COVID generally, you know within this country within the world, there's a rush. There's, a, there's like a rush to judge like decisions and, and, and we don't know and we don't know what, what it's going to look like, what, any, what football or anything's going to look like in a month's time, in six months' time, in 12 months' time. We don't know what football clubs are going to look like. And also we don't know whether it's a, it's, a, it's a good thing to you know, use this moment to spend £40 million on James Rodriguez. We don't know. Well, just on risk though, John, I think that the other thing is it's, it's when you begin to go through risk. So it looks like Newcastle are going to do Ryan Fraser. They've already done Jeff Hendrick on a free. They may well add Callum Wilson to that. Yeah. But there is a thing where Newcastle's underlying numbers last season were that of a side that should have been a lot closer to relegation than they were. And that's what their risk reward is. And I think that this is where on the risk front and this, this is where things are difficult effectively to, to, to for us to sort of analyze without taking not just one step back but arguably about 10 the worst thing that could imagine going down imagine getting relegated from the premier league into the cesspit which is the championship if you're not prepared for it during a COVID 19 outbreak whilst all this is ongoing as well this is the you know 2020 2021 could be the worst season to get relegated conceivable because of the long-term financial damage it could do so therefore then your that's the risk that you've got to mitigate against if you're these other clubs and we're just not in that position we're not gonna we can say i'd like to think on this podcast today can we all agree we are not going to go down this season if we can all agree that that'd be ace and we can move forward off that basis whereas this is where you know for us going down to finishing outside the top four and i'd be absolutely astounded if that happened as well frankly from a liverpool point of view and so this is therefore this is the the backdrop of where you're analyzing risk and rewards within and we're doing it on one front and other clubs are doing it on the others and all this as well also makes me massively judge what everton are doing negatively so that's a positive but, <laughs> but newcastle are you know a really strong example of a club who do need to do something who do need to do something to ensure they're not going to finish 18th, 19th or 20th. Yeah, I think that's completely fair. And I think we are in a much stronger position. And also what came out the accounts for me is, you know, and those numbers, you know, the wage stuff is they've decided, you know, and again, it's a It's a, it's a decision. This is a decision yeah, as well. They've decided the best thing we can do is make sure these boss lads stay. So I'm sure, I reckon we were proactive on contracts. I reckon we were going to people who might have been quite happy sitting off on what they were on. No, we're, we're going to get you down. We're going to put your money up and we're going to make sure that you're happy, that your agent's happy. And I think it's notable that when was the last time you heard Mo Salah linked away? 
like you know he'd be one of the biggest stars in world football he's absolutely brilliant when was the last time you saw you know a, 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 a link that, that looked semi plausible and that's that's what happens when you when you weigh lads in do you know what I mean he's suddenly like it's brilliant here we're winning loads of stuff I've got to keep giving me more and more money this is absolutely boss and you know every now and again we get a bit of money to Madrid but I don't think anyone takes it too seriously for me it was the same Virgil van Dijk you know, you know all of them and it's because they're getting looked after it's because it's because their agents don't have to go in, into the papers and, and create stories and, and create a bit of a thing because you know they're probably getting weighed in as well. Do you know what I mean? We see we see the agent fees that Liverpool, you know, are paying every year, and we're not buying anyone. So it's, it's so you know what I mean. So it's 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 going to exist in people, but it's it's just it's harmonious. It's nice, and they they've made the decision that look, if you've got bass lads and you know your boss. Why risk it? Why again? Why risk it? Why you know you look after them, keep hold of them, and make sure they're happy and they're at this football club and they're not looking to go away. Whereas you know in the past it would have been oh suddenly you know he's only got two years left on his deal and oh did this club you know we might have to sell him and things like that and all that. But then it's money in and you're spending it and people get giddy as, as well. They've made the decision not to do that and it's working. And that's the other thing that needs pointing out as well is I'm all up for holding owners to account, but it's got to be based on what they are doing, not what you think might happen. Exactly. And so I'll, I'll, I'll criticise owners when they make mistakes. You know, we were critical on here about the furlough stuff, about the trademark stuff, you know, stuff like that, what they've actually done wrong. And then if we start winning stuff, I'll be like, well, hang on, we, you know, what, what's going on here? But right now, uh, we've only just stopped being champions of everything, but we're still champions of a fucking lot. <laughs> it does not give you a lot of leeway, I think, winning stuff. Let's jump to Carl. The point is, it feels the point. like it isn't. Yeah. And that's the yeah. point, is that in yeah, fact, no. it doesn't feel like it has given, given anyone, anyone much leeway. Leeway yeah. is not is in short supply, Carl. Yeah. And that's the surprising thing. Yeah, I think that's that, that's where I am with it. Though. There's a whole sense of, when I get critical of the club, which is a lot, um, now there's a large voice in my head shouting, yes, but... <laughs> dot, yeah. dot, dot. Yeah, and I realise not everyone's like that in, at all, but... Um, yeah, it's it's... It's quite difficult to argue with an ownership who have delivered a European Cup and League Championship, which is all we've ever wanted ever. And there it is on a, on a plate for us. And um, we're all slightly concerned by the fact that time doesn't move backwards and that most of us getting a bit older. And, and there's nothing you can do about that. But um, uh, broadly, I find it very difficult to, to, to argue with the strategy of an owner who has given us that. And even better, in fact, that they've made mistakes, I'd say. So they haven't just walked in and said, we've reinvented football and this is how you do things. They, they always made the bragging that we're going to try and do some, we're going to be smart and everyone else, we're going to, you know, we're going to mm. play the game differently than everybody else, which is what they did when they came in. Didn't necessarily work. And I like the fact that they've changed that strategy and, you know, bought the goalkeeper, bought Virgil van Dijk, spent the big money on it. And, you know, if, if there's got to be a bit of husbandry after that, then I'd rather do that from position of league champions the, than, the, be, well, than, than being fourth. The husbandry after it, uh, Gareth is is the interesting part in this is that this is, you know, the idea of the new shiny things of the new players, you know, is always always tempting within football. But this is, this is almost the I say before this is the this is the 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 thing about getting everything right. If you get everything right, you end up with with a squad of players who want to stay together and who all know how to win, yeah. and they want to stay together. But therefore, though, if they want to stay together, you've got to pay them accordingly. And now we've got, you know, we've got a super club wage bill. When Miguel Delaney writes extended pieces about super clubs and the damage they do to football, there's always this thing that as I read them, I'm thinking I should theoretically be on Miguel's side here, but it's boss supporting a super club. <laughs> when Evertonians are doing their, we'll never break into the financial elite, yadda, 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 financial fair play is unfair. I'm like, yes, lads, I can see your point, but I think it's great that we created a system that keeps you out. <laughs> I want Liverpool to be the super club, but this is almost part of, 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 how, of the process of Liverpool being becoming one of those super clubs is that you're going to make the wage bill absolutely massive. The commercial income, which is one of the things that comes through the Swiss Ramble thing, is going to be a little bit behind for a couple of years as everyone gets used to the fact that Liverpool are one of the big five clubs in the world. So we need to get that right next and get at the club be earning that money. That's not a fun thing to say on the Anfield Rap podcast, but that's something that they've got to do next in order to get that in so that they can keep going back to the well over and over and increasing the pot of money that they can spend on the club itself, including transfers, including wages and including infrastructure. And it's a, and it's a process. It's a, and that is a process, what you just talked about. And that's a process that, you know, we're, we're living through. So, you know, there's, there's, there's no guarantee again, whatever we did that we, we, we automatically, 
go and win another title. What we've got to what, what we've got to do is be in the conversation for a title, and I think we will be. I mean, you know, to put it into context, I can remember, you know, going back like to two thousand and one, going to Barcelona and speaking to Barcelona fans, young young Barcelona fans at the time, and they were like, Liverpool. You know, it wasn't a, Liverpool wasn't a thing for them then. They were just like, Liverpool's not on my radar. Like, you can guarantee Liverpool are on the radar now, literally because we locked them out the Champions League, but also because we're winning Premier League titles and Champions League titles. So, you know, you can see on, on the Swiss Ramble stuff that the revenue's going up and up. Um, it's still to reach the levels of some of our rivals. Uh, they'll always be able to spend more money than as a team for the foreseeable future. So we have to do, and Jürgen Klopp has said this, we have to do things a little bit differently. And it, it's not, I, I know what Carl's on about, about that it grinded a little bit when it was sort of like, oh yeah, we're dead clever and we, we know what we're going to do and we're going to, and you know, and some of that was a bit, some of that was a bit grinding because you were a bit like, mm, come on. Um, but, buy him. But, but, <laughs> but, Just but buy not, him. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But you know, <laughs> the, we've heard a lot about the processes that go on behind the scenes and how much effort they put into buy you know, scouting players and then looking into the lives and all the rest of it. And you've got, you've got to say that, you know, it's been successful. And, and you know, we're, we're being a bit cleverer with, with money than perhaps we once were. You know, once upon a time, we were a bit of a laughing stock in that we were spending loads of money and it didn't work and it didn't happen for us. And, you know, and then we were all saying, well, why, why didn't we just hang on to that money? Why did we go out and get second or third or fourth choice? Why didn't we just hang on? And now, sort of, it seems that maybe we've reached a place where that's exactly what we're doing, and yet the complaints continue. And it's a, it, it's it's that it's that banner, isn't it, Carl? What, what was it again? I know you, I remember you tweeting it. Um, basically, along the lines of we've always, we're always fucking moaning about something. Oh yeah, we've all got a cop on about something right down the front <laughs> of the cop, right the yeah, way yeah. across yeah. the cop. Yeah. It's um, true, isn't it? Yeah. It is, but one of the things that that hurts us, John, and again, this is this is within the, the the full conversation. Is England is just harder, so it's actually pretty easy. And I mean it with the greatest of respect. It's pretty easy to be buying Juve and Paris Saint Germain in the Super Club sort of firmament. And I mean, if you're Paris Saint Germain, fuck knows who you'd actually play other than Leon. Um, and we go from there. Barcelona and Real are a really interesting point is that they're the only non English super clubs who have an internal rivalry worth a carrot, and both have become an absolute mess in different ways across the last couple of years. Almost like the stress of it all's got to them. But there is a, this is one of the problems, though, is how England works. That top four in England is a literal thing. No one has retained until City did it. No one had retained the title since Ferguson last retained the title in 2009. Uh, I think it was 08 09 when United beat us to the title that year that was the last time anyone had retained the title in this country so again within all of that it is harder to do this stuff in England how England works as a context is very different to how it works for Bayern for Juve for Paris Saint-Germain for Barca and for Real yeah no absolutely it reminds me a lot of um, I remember when Tiger Woods was absolutely awesome and he was like two to one to win the Masters, and it was it was so short. Do you know what I mean? Like normally the favourite to win a golf tournament to be six or seven to one, but he was two to one because he was that good. And then someone was talking about it on the telly, and we're like, yeah, but that still means that he's more than likely not to win it than he will. So basically, uh, what the bookies are saying is someone from the field will, will will probably be Tiger Woods. We just don't know who it is, and and, and that's and that's the situation where you look now at the odds for the Premier League. You know, some I know some have got Man City as favourites. Uh, other people might leave Liverpool favourites, but whatever it is, whoever you make the favourites for the Premier League, it's more likely that someone else will win it than them in terms of the bookie odds and in terms of just just how how you how you sort of equate it. I know you've said you think Liverpool have got a forty five percent chance of winning the league. Well, that means you're saying that it's more than more likely that they won't win it next season than yep. they will just about. But that, I mean, that's the sort of what you're, you're you're saying, and so we need to you know get to grips with that. You know, and if people are saying that we need to win the next the league next year or you know i will i don't know spontaneously combust i'm like well you need to you need to start preparing yourself for that then because we might not like i think we will win the league i make us favorites i think we win the league because we've got the best team and we've got the best manager and once we get fans back in the ground you know we're, we're the best of back and our lads in that way and stuff like that as well so i'm i'm confident but we might not <laughs> do you know what i mean and it'll be fine we'll just have another go the year after um, just have another go with the year after is I, I think the most important thing, Carl, and the thing that comes from the Swiss Ramble numbers for me 
what I want is I want to be talking. I the super club thing I think is massive, and that's what I don't want to get left behind or leave. And listen, I'm all for reforming football, but I'm also all for going to watching a Liverpool side that's got a fighting chance of winning major honours as many seasons as possible. And that's why when I go through the Swiss Ramble threads, one of the things that I take from it, from, from the financial conversations, is we're gearing up to be going nowhere. And I understand, like, I'm the one who's the most concerned, certainly on Anfield Rap Show, is about 21 to 25. But I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's not like Michael Edwards hasn't spotted that. I'm not so arrogant as to think that I've spotted this and Michael Edwards is in his going, I tell everything's rosy, everything's fantastic, it'll be like this forever and aging doesn't happen. You know, Liverpool will be on top of that. It's something that I do think that does need to be addressed, but I'm certain that people are thinking about it and, and considering it. But what I want genuinely more than anything is, I, we're sitting here now, September 2020, is I want to be having a conversation possibly with you three in September 2030, where Liverpool have pulled off two or three league titles, have pulled off a couple of European Cups, have maybe won a domestic cup, you know, if, if things get a bit get, get, get absolutely crazy. Uh, Liverpool have maybe won a domestic cup or two. And then within there, we're still talking about, and this year we've got a, we've got a fighting chance, we've got a four in 10 chance of winning the league this year. That's the aim of all of this. Yeah. And I think that that's what the numbers are of positions us to be able to do. I don't, I'm not, I don't look at those numbers and think, Oh God, we're going to be in real trouble in no time. I'm actually quite the opposite. We've given everything that we're up against, which is clubs owned by States or by Roman Abramovich. We're actually really, really well positioned to, to be hanging around. That's it. It's like Julio used to say about preparation comes before everything else. And, um, Liverpool's, I'm going to write about this this week. Liverpool's next step for me is legacy. And you can't, Leicester City couldn't build a legacy. You can't, you can't go from out, rank outsiders to miraculously winning the league, although it would be quite handy if someone else got some other points around that season as well. But you can't go from that to four Champions Leagues in seven years. You can't do that. Um, you've got to have that, that basis there of, you know, as, as what Gibbo was saying before about keeping the best players, hoping they don't get old, that sort of thing. That's why you need that there. That's why the Super Club model is there. So to put you in a position where you can continue what we've done already. I don't want Liverpool to be in a situation where we won the Champions League last year, we won the league this year, and then in seven years later, we win the League Cup. We can't afford to be having that because, you know, we, we all sat in the room and talked about 2013 and 14, just, just before just before the... Um, just before we, we the start of the 15 season and thinking, we were all saying, now it begins, now we build and now we go on from here, we do it this way and we did very much the opposite of that. This The only worry for me about this situation is we can't be satisfied with that and we don't want to be in a situation where we'll think one day we're as big as Bayern Munich, one day we'll be as big as Barcelona in the current in the current sphere because at the moment we are, we're top of the tree, not maybe yeah. Bayern Munich, but um, we can't allow ourselves to think that's enough now. Um, we've got the league, everyone had everyone 10 minutes off, everyone's a bit relieved. I'm more relieved than ecstatic, to be honest, that we've won the league, because it feels like finally something's, been, something's happened. But we can't, allow, we can't not look at legacy, legacy comes next. Uh, Gareth, just on that, and just to sort of sum this up, and before we move on to other things, including being excited about uh, bits and pieces of what we saw on Saturday. Hey. Uh, <laughs> there is... Only Blackpool. There is, <laughs> there is... There is that legacy question, and that's the main thing. And as I say, that's what, for me, the numbers underpin. People see the numbers there today that has come through that thread as, oh, God, what are we going to do if and when Klopp leaves or if and when, you know, these players grow old? We're going to always have to sell to buy. That's not in there. We're, we're putting money into other projects. There's been the training facility in yeah. there as well. Uh, there is sort of, you know, the decisions that have been made to lead to this point. There is loads of room to grow in a commercial sense uh, from a Liverpool point of view, which will then also lead... To, to more money to come in you know we've done all of this and as you said before this process isn't finished we may actually only be a th- halfway two-thirds of the way through the process let alone at the end of the process and that's that's the legacy thing that Carl's talking about that we've got to end this what we are which is absolute European giants and we've but we've also got to act like European giants let's 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 give it the big one yeah, that, that walk and the walk of, of the elite club is what we all want, isn't it? And that, that's what we've believed we are all the way through. I think the problem, you know, for many years and under many leaderships and managers and all the rest of it, we weren't. And, and you know, so that was why, you know, I, I've wrote loads of times, spoke loads of times about, you know, people outside our bubble taking the piss out of us and saying we're old romantics and saying we're banging on about 
the past and history and all that. Well, we don't have to anymore because here and the here and now we're brilliant. And obviously, you know, back to what you said before about fear, I, I totally understand that people want us to stay there. And when they don't see us going out and buying all these elite players, you know, one after the other, like to see in other clubs do. I understand the fear, but I honestly think we're putting all the building blocks in place. That That's why I'm happy and content with where we are. You know, we've done what we've done to Anfield already. It looks great. It feels good when you're in there. You look at that big stand and think, yeah, looks boss that. They're going to do something with the Anfield Road, albeit it's on hold now, but, you know, you'd expect to see something similar. And then maybe you can start talking about the cop one day, who knows, but... You know, stuff, building blocks are in place. You know, the, the training facilities are going to be second to none. You know, having the ground look like it does, having the training facilities that we will have, that is walking the walk of an elite club as well. So, you know, when, when you're going out trying to recruit young players and you're coming up against other clubs, and we've, we've always had that and we always will have that, when they walk into Liverpool and they see the training facilities and there's a wow factor and you've got Jürgen Klopp and you can point to young players and the pathway to the first team and all that kind of stuff, that's building blocks to be in an elite club as well. So, you know, I just, I, like I say, I, I can't get myself into a state about where we are um, other than despair at some of the, you know, comments I, I personally seem to receive. I know I'm not alone in that. Um, but Because I just think about all the times when we've been an absolute mess. And it's not just Hicks and Gillette. It's, yep. you know, war and factions within the same club. It's, you know, Kirby not being on the same... Him sheet as Melwood, it's you know one hundred divvies. Yeah, all all that you know. There's there's been so many things that that back to using the phrase what I used before have been wearing made it hard to be a Liverpool fan, it, and and it was particularly fucking awful under Hicks and Gillette. Obviously, you know, you know every day was consumed by this horrible, you know, argument between ourselves, worrying about where the club was going, you know reading all these records seemingly week after week about how bad we were, how, you know, lowest, worst start since the 50s, <laughs> near the relegations. You know, I, I had one of those moments on Saturday just watching that friendly. I was like, shit, Blackpool. Remember, yeah, they, could, the... remember they came to town and bossed us everywhere yeah, all over easily. the pitch. The Charlie Adam incident. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy about where we are. I'm happy about what I see happening in the future. And I can't get too wound up about it. And if other people want to get wound up and give me shit, well, I've kind of decided that I've had enough of that and I'll probably call you a cunt on the internet. So, you know, you know what you're getting into. <laughs> Marvellous stuff. <laughs> to look forward to. Could it, I just think it's worth saying as well that, like, I know people sometimes don't like when, you know, people talk about oh, what's going on online. And like, well, it's just online or it's just Twitter or it's just whatever. But I think the problem with that is, like, that's, that's the whole place where football sort of discussion is now do you know what I mean we, we haven't got the ground so so for example like have a look at Nico Williams's um, social media have a look at his Twitter and Instagram it's, it's a disgrace and it, it's embarrassing there's, there's basically Liverpool fans calling him shit do you know what I mean he's scoring a goal for Wales and people are going back to him and going are oh, you still crap though but you need to work, tell him what he needs to work on like he doesn't fucking know and he hasn't got a manager do you know what I mean so it's <laughs> helping him and it, and, it, and it just gets me angry and it's fair enough saying I'll ignore it, but the problem is that Nico Williams hasn't isn't isn't going out and about at the moment in Liverpool and got people saying, "Oh, boss, you know, thing, you know." So they that, that I get that that's always sort of exists, but Nico Williams doesn't get to run out in front of Anfield and get a big cheer when he makes a big tackle or whatever. So he's yeah. he's not getting that at the moment. He's not getting the support of the match day crowd. He's not getting, as I say, he's not out and about in town with people going, "Oh, boss, you know, made up for you" and all that. And then so all he's getting at the moment is is the online stuff and all these young players that are on social media, maybe more. Than and they should be, but they are sort of on there. And they're seeing it. You don't need to ask Nico Williams and tell him what, what you think of him unless you're going to say something like good because what is the point? And so I think it is more dangerous than ever what's going on online, I think. And so I understand the general point that you can just sort of ignore it. But I think... As I, I said, really want Nico now to take Robbo's approach. <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening, Nico, and you want to start doing that, you just give us a shout, mate, and we'll yeah. back you up to the hills. Yeah, yeah, ab- absolutely. Yeah, but, but... No, that's the thing, though. They're not going to reply, are they? Can you imagine if he replied? <laughs> He's definitely not going to reply to that. Do you know what? You've got a point, mate. Well, oh, yeah, no, yeah, there, no, there was yeah. one last year, last season or the season before, Carl, where Maitland Niles at Arsenal was getting terrible abuse from Arsenal supporters, and he started going back. 
and yeah. he was dead sound. But it was a, about the, some of the most thoroughly depressing discourse you can imagine. Yeah. You know, Maitland Niles going back on. Well, I can see, yeah, I was a bit sloppy for that goal, but I'm trying my best. And you're just thinking, God in heaven, you know, you don't yeah. need this. And you, you, it, it's hard enough playing footy. <laughs> it's quite intense yeah. playing footy. The last thing you need is to throw this in as well. And you've just fed them. You've just fed the people who crave that. Yeah. What, things like you just give them what they want. Um, no, that's really fair, John. I think it is a really fair point. And as I say, normally, I, we, we, I mean, we have meetings at the Anfield Rap about talking less about what's happening online and trying to talk more about where things are. We literally bang on about it, but it is currently a situation where, well, that, but most people, that's where most people are. Uh, quite obviously, my front door's going. So in a really <laughs> unprofessional way, I'm going to go and deal with that. Uh, Robbo, uh, just talk about our boss, Harvey Elliott, was for me for a minute, and then I'll be back. <laughs> okay, no worries. Yeah, Harvey Elliott was great. Um the, the the Blackpool game, like I said before, I, I, I just sort of really enjoyed because I thought, you know, it's the final friendly and all the rest of it. Um, I kind of forgot about it and then I tuned in, put it on. And it was great because it was great that, you know, it didn't start how we wanted it to start. And, you know, you can look at errors and mistakes and stuff like that. But I just thought there was loads of stuff to be happy about. And, you know, Minamino... Um, you know, I've worried about him, worried about his strength, worried about can he fit into the Premier League, worried about him during lockdown, being on his Todd in England. Um, but he seems to have got better with the language. And you can just, it's written all over his body language, I think, as well, when you watch him play football now that he's settled, he's happy, he knows what he's doing, he's turning on the ball, he's positive. So I'm talking about Minamino, by the way. Mate, have hardly done any Harvey Elliott. <laughs> <Nice. laughs> yeah, uh, Harvey was Harvey was brilliant as well, and he, he's really exciting. Thought the uh, piece that uh, James Pierce did with him the other week was really Excellent. good as well. Um, just about you know, it was really interesting. A few, told me a few bits that I didn't know about sort of you know his families up here with him, um, living with him which is a nice touch, but also things like, you know, Milner taking him under his wing, which I think you saw in the celebration yeah. at, at the weekend. Um, but, all, but also stuff like, you know, I, I love the stuff when you see it, like, you know, in training, the throwing him at fullback and going, uh, you, know, you know, crack on with this, like, go and deal with uh, Mo Salah and see how you get on. And so, you know, you know, because the other side of his game looks phenomenal, let's be honest, you know, his touch... The bit of class he's got already at this very young age. He can obviously finish. He can pass. He's got vision. Uh, he, he looks a little bit stronger already as well, mm-hmm. I think. He looks another one where, you know, he's been on the clock diet, been on, we always say being on the stakes. It's not the stakes these days, is it? That, that's it's because... tofu, lad. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it, 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 you know, him and Curtis are really exciting. You know, Nico as well. Nico isn't shit. Um, and, and that was a brilliant moment. You know, I'm getting that winner for Wales. You know, yeah. who, who didn't love that? Come on. You know, and, and, and I love the way we had the old school Piley on as well. Yeah. We, we just couldn't see him anymore. <laughs> and then he was the mate at the end. Of, like, he, had, he hadn't been able to breathe for about two minutes. Um, so, you know, that was brilliant as well. And, and that, that, you know, that really, that lifted me, both the friendly, that little moment in the... Um, in the Wales game as well, because that, that's what football's about. That's what we're in it for, those kind of moments, not banging on about balance sheets. Uh, and the big one for me in the, you know, I'm, I'm, you've done Minamino there, uh, Carl, but the big one for me in the friendly was was Kaita. I think second half, Kaita comes out, he's playing a little bit deeper, which I'm intrigued by. He can see more of the pitch, and my God, does he see the pitch. You know, the more I see Naby Kaita, the more I think he's just, it's like his head's on a stick. He can see everything, he knows where everyone is. And when he get, when he starts just directing traffic in that way in which he does, he's such an exciting footballer to watch. He's such a Liverpool centre mid. It, it reminds me of, um, I had an interview with Don Hutchison once, and he said, when the ball, when, you, when you're playing centre mid and the ball's coming towards you, you know where the ball's going. And, and he, call, he calls it taking photos as the ball's approaching you. You know where he is. You know he's about to run. You know he's sitting back. You know where that defender's going. And you've got to do all that and then pass it as fast as you can. Um, and I think the greatest thing about Naby Keita that I always think is I never see him change his head, move his head ever. And he just knows that they're there. Yeah. And, you know, his key strength, obviously, is going past people. And he, he loves the one-two on the edge of the box at Sadio. Absolutely loves that. Um, but I think when he plays deeper... I think he's going to have a bit more about that. We're going to bring more of that about to his game. I think um, he's just he's just so good at sort of knowing where everyone is at the same time. Um, and I don't like he frustrates me a hell of a lot of the time as well. Sometimes I do wish he'd look up a bit more and you know maybe not quite run to the uh, the edge of the pitch as often as he used to do in a Milan Barros type way. But um, since since sort of the last six months or so when I've seen him play, 
he, he's like the charity shield. He, he just he sees things rather than you know what we normally do, which is go wide and then put and then put it in. He, now we're going to through the middle with him, and I think Minamino is going to be doing a, a lot more of this as well. A direct attacks on the centre backs or going behind them or putting balls behind them, and I think that's we always talk about you know new ways to win, and I think that's what um, Jurgen Klopp's going to develop, develop more now. Of thinking, no, you want to, don't just worry about these two, the two fullbacks we've got. We've got lads who can hurt people now in the middle of the park, and even when they drop deep, they can still put these lads into. We've I think got, I think him and Minamino are going to be really really interesting this season. Well, we play Leeds, uh, John, on Saturday, and I'm desperate for the managers to start with the midfielder for Binho, Kaiser, and Jones. Like I really want to see him start for Binho, Kaiser, and Jones. That'd be that would be the the, the midfield I pick for the, for this one. I wouldn't necessarily be picking that one for the game against Chelsea. But I would love to see him go uh, for Binho, Kaiser, and Jones. I don't think you will. Um, I don't think you go for those three. It's it's interesting on the on the Kaiser one, isn't it? Because he doesn't pick him uh, in the Community Shield, uh, which I might be looking a bit too much into it. But would suggest as maybe you know he doesn't completely sort of trust him. You know, in those bigger games at the moment. But I think first game back, we'll we'll assume that Trent's available and, and Trent will be. Will, will be starting and, and, and ready to go. I don't think he, w- he would risk Henderson, um, you know, from the start because obviously he's not played. So I think Henderson's more likely to be sort of from the bench, you know, if he is sort of trading, you know, like he sort of seems to be. So I think you, I, I think you'll pick Wijnaldum, and I think you know, there's there's obviously a lot of things going on with Genie at the moment. You know, there's there's the rumours, there's you know, the, obviously the contract situation is the one thing that we do know, and and that's not sort of getting start, started, but. I don't see him taking him out the side, you know, no matter what, unless he's literally minutes away from signing for Barcelona. And then I still think you'd ask him to do a bit first, just before you go, mate. Um, <laughs> just go, just box this for us, do you know what I mean? Because that's how he's he's, he's used him, hasn't he? He's, he's, he's been his go-to guy in, in most situations. And I think he will be again in this one. So I think you'll pick, for, I think you'll go for Fabino, um, Gini and, and, and Kaita in this one. But I just think it's, you know, there's a little doubt in my mind that he doesn't go Kaita in the community shield. Uh, but, but again, I thought, I thought he's, he's, he's done well whenever he has played in this preseason. Indeed. Uh, listen, loads and loads of stuff about all of that. We're going to do, uh, there's, a, there's a subscribers fantasy football uh, and we're changing a lot of the offering around video and one of the things we're looking to do is to, is to do a little sort of 10 minute show for you on a Thursday around fantasy football. Um, Mo's going to be hosting that one and we're really excited. That's just one of the new things we're doing on video. There's an awful lot and me and Gareth will do a video talking about the videos at some point this week, uh, but there is an awful lot of change, an awful lot of difference and expect more videos, uh, but with them perhaps being a little bit shorter Although we have got a very exciting uh, Friday afternoon show uh, lined up for you, which is mostly uh, my excuse to get off work early and get to the pub. Uh, that is coming from Friday. Uh, that should be for you as well. It's called the Friday night, so we've got that as well. Uh, we're trying to see if we can... So, Oh, yeah, if, so if go in the subscriber forum to find the fantasy football thing, and I'll put it in my newsletter, and you can sign up to my newsletter from the website if you want, and we can all enjoy that together. So it's the mainstream fantasy football thing. You can find that on there. So do do that, and do sign up to the newsletter if you get the opportunity to do so. And all the details that you need will be in there. We're looking to do a live show, possibly a watch along for Leeds United at home in a way that is completely socially distanced, uh, has the opportunity to be safe, but gets us together in a room really and gives you reason. We'll be selling the tables in bubbles and working all that out. We probably won't be selling ones to this, to be quite honest with you. It will be uh, units. We're working on that if we can do it. This is me just saying if we can do it, we might not be able to. Uh, We're looking at all the ins and outs of it today. Um, We obviously know the game against Leeds is coming pretty soon uh, so you know you're getting to see a bit behind the curtain here we're doing everything we can as soon as this show finishes I'm going to jump a train uh, to go and do this meeting uh, where John's going to pick me up and we're going to run down to the potential venue and see what's happening that's what's happening on that so we'll let you know if we can do that and if we can we'll be looking to sell sell, sell a fair few tickets for it from Saturday and then but we'll also be looking to then do Chelsea and possibly even do Arsenal on the Monday night we're working all that out as we go uh, last little thing um, is that we went to see Liverpool women yesterday John uh, they drew one all uh, uh, with Durham, it was a good game. I really enjoyed it, to be honest with you. And that was nice to watch. Football. It was the first time I've watched football in person for six months, uh, so that if it at least had that to recommend it. So thank you to uh, the people at Liverpool who invited us along there, and we we know we're fortunate to get to sit in the the media part for that. Uh, they were frustrated in the end, Liverpool, and arguably they were a little bit frustrating as well. Yeah, it was a shame that they couldn't hold on. 
really because they, they looked fairly comfortable by then. I mean, Durham certainly had the moments in the match and looked like they'll cause problems for most teams that they play this season. Very physical side, they're very tough, very well organised as well. But Liverpool had, had got ahead and then, and then second half, the longer it went on, the more sort of in control they looked. They seemed to be growing in confidence. Uh, and then and they got the sort of sucker blow out of nowhere, really. And so it was a shame. And I know uh, we didn't hang on to speak to the manager, but I know Emma Sanders did, who did the post-match show with us and said she was, you know, she was gutted you know, as you can imagine. But, you know, we're all still hopeful. Uh, and I know everyone involved is still hopeful that they could have a good season. So keep an eye out for them. Uh, obviously, you know, as soon as people can go out and go and see them, uh, we'll let people know. And, and I'm sure the club will, you know, we'll be letting people know as well. But in the meantime, you know, it, you can follow them online and things like that. But, yeah, not quite a, a winning start that we were hoping for, but still they are off and running now and we'll see how they go. Indeed, we will. Uh, thank you very much for the Anfield wrap this week. I uh, hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, it is worth pointing out that at some point things will go wrong for Liverpool. Uh, there is a Don DeLillo line, he may be on the bookshelf there behind Carl, that all plots <laughs> tend deathward. Uh, and that is always true in that if you keep saying we're going to make a mess of it then at some point you will be right we will make a mess of it Manchester United have made a mess of it Manchester City have made a mess of it Chelsea have made a mess of it Arsenal have emphatically made a mess of it and look at Goodison Park where they make a mess of it on a regular basis if you say things will go wrong eventually you will be proven right but let's be absolutely crystal fucking clear that is no way to live that's the Anfield wrap (laughs) 